Trigger warning. This podcast contains descriptions of various abusive situations. Listener discretion is advised. You are listening to the Preacher Boys Podcast, a podcast shedding light on decades of mental, physical, and sexual abuse within the independent fundamental Baptist movement. The testimonies shared on this podcast are told from the personal experience and perspective of the survivors. Not all legal outcomes are known or final. Any suspect is presumed innocent until proven guilty in the court of law. To find more information about the Preacher Boys podcast and upcoming documentary, visit PreacherBoysDoc.com or connect on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter with the handle at PreacherBoysDoc. Now, here is your host... Eric Skwarzynski. All right, guys. Thank you so much for watching the Preacher Boys podcast. I'm sitting here today with Amanda Householder. If you are on TikTok, you've probably seen her video pop up here and there. Um, If you're in any of the Facebook groups for people who grew up within the IFP movement, any support groups, anything like that, um, she's super active there. You've probably seen some content. Um, And she is doing a lot of really good work, hundreds of thousands of views on these videos, um, showcasing the abuse at Circle of Hope, uh, which is a reform school. Um, I've been excited to actually get to talk to a lot of people from these schools because it's something that I only heard the positive PR about, you know, growing up. So, um, Amanda, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Can you just tell people who you are and kind of introduce, you know, what you're doing and kind of what your mission is? Yeah, thank you for having me. Um... My name is Amanda Householder. Um, my parents do own and operate Circle of Hope Girls Ranch in Humansville, Missouri. Um, my goal right now is to spread awareness to um, these abusive boarding schools because um, my main push was because there is a girl who, um, she, uh, I think she was sent to Circle of Hope in 2007, but um, I do have pictures dated 2006. Okay. Um, but she was sent there and I think she was 15 or 16 and she's been there ever since. Um, she is, um, disabled and her parents handed co co guardianship over to my parents. And so, um, I don't know. I just started thinking about how, like, I didn't want to be there after I turned 18. And so it just got to me. And so I just decided to like try to help spread the word to get her out and in a safe environment. Right. So, um, I mean, the, the first time that I ever found you and ever like became aware of who you were and even that circle of hope existed was when you shared the first video that you ever shared publicly, which was a, um, and I'll insert it into the episode, but it was, uh, basically a, a video where you could just hear your dad in the video, you know, telling one of the workers to knock one of the students out. Knock her out. Yes, sir. I mean it. Knock her out. Yes, sir. And that goes for any of the rest of you. If she clenches her fist or she's going to hit you, that's a threat. Knock her out. Yes, sir. You got that, Ashlyn? Yes, sir. And are you being... I watched the video. I was like, what is it? Like, what is this? Like who, what is this? Who is this? And, you know, I was reading through the comments and like, it didn't take long to see that there's a lot of people who understood exactly the situation you were showing. Um, and yeah, I mean, then going on to TikTok, seeing your stuff there, getting more information about it. Um, it was, it was pretty eye opening. Um, and, and like I said, my, my experience and knowledge of, these kind of schools was growing up, we would have people come in from Agape and say, you know, it's a, it's a really strict school. Um, and you know, but it's for the people that need a strict school. And that was kind of the, and, and like growing up, it was like, Oh, it makes sense. Like I'm not a bad kid, so I would never get sent here, but whoever goes there probably deserves it. You know, that kind of thing. But then doing this show, I start seeing all these stories and I'm like, there's a lot more to this than uh, what we heard growing up. So um, so, so were you, is this as long as you can remember you were involved in this or was it something that as a young kid, your parents started doing or what, what was kind of your introduction to all of this? Um, for as long as I can remember, I was growing up in this situation. I do know stories from what like my parents have told me from like a time we weren't in these and I have seen pictures, but I don't remember. I like, I don't remember living with my grandma, um, 
I don't let, remember anything before working in, um, it was called Faith Children's Home in Tampa, Florida in like 1994, I think it was. And so um, th- those are my, those are my earliest memories are being at that school. Um, was it initially, like, was it initially negative? Was it something where like for a long time you felt like, oh, this is just normal and you didn't, because when you grew up in it, that's always, it's kind of the same conversation I had with um, Benjamin Williams from Pepsiba House. Like, he's like, it was normal to me. That's all I knew. So was that how it was for you? Or did you always feel like, this is kind of weird that we do this? No, it was normal. But the thing that, that made it normal for me, looking back at it, is at this place, we had to call all of the staff aunt and uncle. And so those people literally as a like four year old became my family. Hmm. Um, even to this day, like I have um, friends that are, are like cousins to me because their parents worked there and um, we just kept in contact. Um, but it, it's weird because um, growing up, like being that young there, it was, it was fun. Um, I was still being like what I, a, I say I was being abused because my dad went over the top with our spankings and stuff, but from that was just from birth anyways, but it was different because I had this huge family that like would take care of me when my parents, I, it was just like, I could go hang out with the girls and like hang out with the the students and not be around my parents around that time. So it was fun. Um, I don't really remember a bad time except they did have a room that I was not allowed to go into because that was the room they did spankings in. And obviously if I went in there, it would be me getting a spanking next. So um, I need to stay away from that room. Um, But being so young, I, the first time I don't remember really a bad time. Yeah. No. So um, obviously, you know, now like with all the stuff you're putting out, all the stories like, you know, I'm seeing stories every single day posted of people sharing their experiences. And so, you know, obviously looking back in retrospect, there's a lot of things that were happening that shouldn't have been happening. Um, yeah. when, when was the time that you first like, or maybe the first incident where you were like, this is not just a, you know, a place where they're trying to help people. There's something else here that's like not as positive and, you know, maybe is a negative place. Um, I would say agape. Um, but that was because, um, when we got to agape, I was 11. And, um, when we toured the property, they had this like room that was, um, right next to the, um, staff bathrooms. And, um, actually the, which is weird, the female bathroom connected to this room. So like we could go into this room, but this room was all padded and carpeted or not padded. It was just carpeted. So it had like the cheapest carpet you could think of on it. Um, and I remember, um, boys going up there and then coming back and they were, um, bloody. It wasn't just like bruises. They were like bloody. Um, but we knew that as girls, we weren't supposed to be looking at the boys. So like, it wasn't something you could like stare at or like get involved right. in anything like that. So oh. that's basically when I kind of started realizing that these kids were going through, um, what I was going through at home. So, okay. So noticing that was a little bit weird. So what's the, so a lot of these houses are connected. So that's the weird thing I'm finding out is like, there's as much as the IFB is interconnected, like these homes are also connected in similar ways. So how does this work? So like you're, it's faith children's home in Florida. Then there's connection at Agape. Was it just them transferring and working at different schools before any of it circle of hope or were they connected? Was it like a ministry of agape? Like how did that work? Well, um, so a lot of the schools are connected because they do send students from like one school to another. If like they need to replace a student, um, a lot of them do move staff and a lot of them like students like the, his Vespa house. I, I butcher that name. I'm so sorry. Uh, uh, Lucinda Pennington, she actually went to that school and then she was a staff member at Hope Children's Home when we were there in Tampa, Florida. And so a lot of them are just either students that know of these schools and go to work at these schools or staff that just transfer from school to school because they know of these schools. Lucinda is an interesting character. <laughs> I was watching, uh, 
I was watching uh, the Dr. Phil, I think everybody was that, that knows anything about this. And, you know, I was just watching her and I was like, man, how are you so convinced of the opposite of what everybody else is saying? Um, and, you know, a lot's come out since then of like her actual credentials and things like that and the things that she was touting herself to be. Um, what was your, what was your kind of, you know, did you know her pretty well or I'm just curious cause she seems very interesting. So I'm curious that she worked in some of the same places. Um, I wasn't allowed to be around her. So, um, I, my parent, I, it's confusing. Cause, um, at one point I was staying at one of the girls house houses and I don't know if you know, with like in the IFB religion, everything's like conviction. So like one person can watch TV and like the other family doesn't. So I was staying with this one girl and my parents found out we were staying up until like three o'clock in the morning watching TV. And so then they made it to where I couldn't um, hang out with people. And well, when Lucinda came, she started enforcing like girls can um, talk to the boys and like girls can wear shorts to the knee, like uh, boy shorts to the knee. And um, well, my dad started talking a lot of stuff about her. Like she's an evil woman. She's this, she's that, she's this, she's that. So that was my opinion on her. I don't know because I did not, um, witness her abuse. I do have friends that were on the receiving end of her abuse. Um, but I do have, what I do have to say is like, I found out later after I saw the Dr. Phil episode. Well, before that, I wanted to reach out to her a couple of times because I knew that my parents could not stand her. And I wanted to reach out to her and ask her why just on my end, trying to, um, validate more of my stuff because I at hope went to people about my abuse and I was just abused more. And so I wanted, I was like, well, she didn't like my parents. I could ask her, her side. Well, then I asked her, I saw that Dr. Phil episode and I was like, no, (laughs) that's not happening. I'm not, because she was like agreed with everything that happened at his FESBA house. And that's what was going on at my parents' house. And so, um, I posted that video and, um, one of the girls that is really good friends with Lucinda was like, Hey, you need to message Lucinda. Like she sees this and she needs, she like needs you to talk to her like now. So I unblocked her (laughs) (laughs) and, um, I, I asked her for her phone number and I called her and well, um, come to find out she was actually fired from that home because she called CPS on my dad three times because she went, my dad do inappropriate things in a room with a girl. And so she was fired from that home. Um, I do say, I do like applaud her for doing that. Cause like no one has ever stood up to my dad before. Um, she said that my dad punched her almost in the face. Like he had her by the neck and um, her husband had to tackle my dad. <laughs> and so like, I was just, that's the first woman I have ever heard to like stand up against my dad, which was weird after seeing the Dr. Phil episode. Yeah. So. Well, it kind of, I mean, it, it, it gives some validity to her claims of like calling out. I mean, obviously that's, and that's the tricky thing with these houses is what people consider abuse varies so much, yeah. especially within the IFB. Like, you know, like there's people who would say spanking of any kind is, you know, abuse or people who would say like, and like, you know, I don't, I, I've never said on the show exactly where I'm at on all that, but like I, cause I don't want to, whatever. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't want to offend people. I don't want people who need to hear the rest of that, you know, to, but like, you know, like there's a lot of things that were normal for like my friends and I growing up that like, I don't do with my daughter because I feel like there's other ways to communicate than, you know, yeah. corporal punishment and things like that. Um, but you know, it's, it's just weird with these, with these homes because like someone like her doesn't see an issue with this kind of spankings that they were administering there. She didn't see a problem with the dietary things and all of that, but then she does blow the horn on, you know, something like that. It's just an interesting, but that's, that's, what's hard about all of this is it's, it's, everybody has this weird, these weird moral gray areas that they just don't step into. Well, it was weird because she said that, well, I, like I said, they spanked uh, Faith and um, Hope when they changed the name, they spanked. But she said when she got there, she like told them that she wasn't going to spank and that they were done spanking. And like my dad was the principal of the school. And I remember him taking girls and boys into his office and him spanking them. But then I remember that ending. So like when I saw that like episode 
And I don't know. I was just really confused. I was just like, I'm like, I just yeah. don't understand. Um, but um, yeah, when she contacted me, she's like, I do not agree with what your dad's doing and stuff like that. And I was like, yeah, neither do I, obviously. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So, uh, I mean, I, okay. So you start realizing, so Agape, you're about how old when you notice that there's, you know, guys are going up. And did you ever find out what that was or, or what was going on there at Agape with the guys called, coming out? It's called a restraining room. Talking to the guys later, it's not a restraining room. It was more of a um, rough it up room. And they would like throw boys around in there. Um, like staff and the the people there or the yeah, guys there? Yeah, it would be like, staff on a guy like that. Um, I know like at Hope, there was this one guy that my dad and him, he was like a 17-year-old boy. Him and my dad would get in like fist fights. And like this kid, not saying like this kid could like – handle himself like he could do run up a wall and like do flips so like it wasn't like he was up against anything that wasn't his match like him and my dad literally would go uh head to head but I think when we got to Agave it like um it was different because he had all of these boys because right uh when I got to be like um 14 there was this kid who um he was younger than me but he was always on the wall he I don't remember a time except maybe like once when he got to sit on the no talking table, but he was always on the wall. Um, and he looked up at me off the wall and my dad over or not overheard, but my dad saw it. And like, my dad walked over to him and he's like, if you ever look at my daughter again, I will restrain you. And so, um, I just remember like, then I was like feeling guilty for that. And like, um, at that time I guilty, had like a- guilty that he looked at you. Guilty that my dad was using me to like, <laughs> to I don't like know. provoke a reaction out of basically people so he could engage. And with this them kid was like much. twelve. It he was he was a little kid. He wasn't he wasn't like the gang members that they had because they did have gang members, and he wasn't like that. He wasn't like a tough kid. He was. I don't know. I just remember feeling like sad for him and like not protective, but just like wanting to like run away and. um but I had already run away like multiple times before this at Agape and it never worked. So um, I just remember thinking like as like 14, 15 thinking like we should all write it and like this place could be like done, but obviously like everyone being very washed, it would have never like, it would have never worked. But yeah, no, I don't feel like at, there was ever a time at Agape that I felt like this was really helping people necessarily like I I still was brainwashed in the fact that like God and hell and all of this stuff but it wasn't like I don't know it it was just more um it was more of the stuff that happened at home like my dad would always pick me up and like throw me around and stuff like that but like that was like openly like happening there basically we weren't allowed to watch it they would yell like uh restraint and we were all supposed to like leave but um I just remember like them doing that and like a whole like swarm of boys just backing up and like all of the staff ladies having to leave and stuff like that. So I don't know, just something didn't feel right necessarily. Um, And when you brought up the, the thing of like, okay, there was a range. So like, obviously this is a 12 year old kid. And then you also have like gang members. And so like, what was the demographics of these schools? Cause it seems like, I know you mentioned one of your videos, like there was a girl at Circle of Hope that was like five years old. So like, was there any set age group? Was it just, and, and what were the reasons parents were sending their kids? Was it primarily like the majority were like hard crimes and like they, they, it's either that or juvie or like that kind of thing. Or was it like anybody for any reason? And we send them. We were what, what led to believe that all of them were gang members there. Um, looking back now and like talking to them after they got out, a lot of them were just sent there for like family issues. Like, um, like some of them had like mental issues that like families couldn't deal with. Some had, um, like they didn't get along with their families or like alcoholism, but a lot of it wasn't like, (sighs) 
I do know they were gang members. Like I do know that um, some of those gang members had like tattoos and stuff like that. Um, but a lot of them now I'm like, they were just innocent, not innocent, but you know, like innocent victims, a normal, a, of, t- a normal team <laughs> or a, a normal. Yeah. yeah. A lot of them didn't know about drugs and stuff until they left. And like, well, not until they left <laughs> um, until like being there because they were talking with their, um, with agape people. And that's how they learned about drugs. That's actually how I learned about drugs. Because it, my brother got sent to Agape and like he would, when he, when he came home, he was like telling me all these things and it was just like, I don't know. It was weird. It was, it's yeah. sad being back on it. Like, right. Yeah. So, um, so you, your, your family's at Agape for a little bit and then, um, end up going to Circle of Hope, which is also in Missouri, correct? Yeah. It's actually right. about. 13 miles um, from the town of Stockton where Agape is. Wow. So it's really close. Yeah. Um, So what, what prompted that move? And then, and then circle of hope, if I understand correctly, like your dad was like running, he wasn't just staff. Like that was his um, thing. Right. Okay. Oh, so he started it from scratch. He didn't take it from anybody or anything. He didn't take it from anybody. He started it from scratch. Um, well, when we were at the home in Florida the first time, they we originally moved because they wanted to start a home, but that didn't work out. Um, okay. So when we got to Agape, they were doing like a shift in um, not ownership, but like a shift in like leadership of staff. And um, my dad was saying that he didn't like it because it was too nice and they were changing, which was the same same excuse as to why we left Faith or Hope. Like too too easy on everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so it sounds like it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh. Uh, well, like I said, like talking to boys now, I honestly don't think it's that. I think it's because the person who was taking over leadership, him and um, this guy uh, just didn't get along. Yeah, he didn't have the control that he wanted. So he exactly. was moved to the next. Exactly. Because this guy, um, his, his name is Brian Clemenson. Um, he's now the owner of Agape. But if you Google Jurassic Elbow, like you'll see, um, his he he has a nickname for his abuse his um he would take his elbow and hit boys as hard as he can on the back of their necks and um i have friends that were on the opposite hand of this abuse and um so like i think because of the extent my dad goes because my dad has the same kind of stories uh, about like i know um there's a story that my dad punched a kid in the gut and stuff like that. So like, it's like physical abuse with these two people. So I think that's why my dad decided to um, open an all girls home. And he said that he didn't want to compete with Agape. And so that's why he was going to do all girls. But Agape also has a girls part called, uh, well, at that point it was refuge, but now it's called wings of faith. So I don't know why it was just girls other than um, after hearing stories. um, I think it was because of his sick, his sick perversions. Did you, and again, as much as you're comfortable sharing or not, but did you, did you sense any of that stuff at the time? Did you ever sense like, Oh, it's weird that my dad does, you know, A, B or C or like, did he do things where you were like, that's really uncomfortable. Or was that too just like, it's just normal. Cause that's what happened, you know? Well, growing up, um, at, even at Lake Hope, he had these girls that he always like favored more than me. He would give them the side hug and like kiss them on the head. And like, I never got that. I never got that from my dad. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was just always weird to me. And I thought he was trying to replace my sister because my sister did pass away. And um, Mm -hmm. growing up and like hearing all the stories from the girls that have left Circle of Hope, it just all started clicking that it wasn't my sister, him trying to replace my sister. It was, and after talking to Lucinda, I was like, oh, so he, it, it was something more sinister than that. It, it was mm-hmm. gross. So. Yeah. Um, so, so you're at Circle of Hope. He opens the school. Um, you know, obviously that's kind of where, I mean, at that point you're 15, 16. I'm 15. Um, 15. Um, so and you're there for about two years. You left at about 16 or 17, right? 17, I, I believe. I left at 17, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. I think it was like January or like December. Like my birthday's right in February. So like it wasn't like too far before my 18th birthday. 
But um, yeah, I was there it, for two and a half years, probably. In Missouri, is seventeen legal where you can leave, or is it eighteen where you're it, an adult? It is seventeen. Okay, I was gonna say. Okay, so um, obviously that's the time where you know you're closest to being an adult, and like you're you're actually you know, you're already going through the normal team, like where you question everything and think through everything. And so, um, you know, obviously kind of crescendos with you, like, I mean, secretly recording what's happening is like, I was watching like, Oh, she has guts to do that. Like I'd be, I'd be out, I'd either be out of there or just be terrified of like, what's going to happen if I get caught doing this. So, um, what, what was the kind of got you in that full on, like, Oh, I'm going to show what's going on here. Like, was that pretty instantly once the home started or was it just like a few months in, you started seeing a lot of this stuff ramp up or. I actually didn't get that video. Um, an ex agape student got that video. Um, Oh, I thought you did. Okay. I thought that was from you. Okay. No, he, um, I stopped talking to him because he was like, uh, my dad, he let, he loved my dad. And then, um, so my dad messaged him back in like, February sometimes saying, Hey, you need to come visit me. And so he went to go visit my dad and he like witnessed my dad do a lot of these things. Like he witnessed my dad, um, make a girl chug like so much water. He's like, that's like poisonous. And, um, and so he like just decided to like use his phone to get a video. Um, but then he messaged me on Facebook cause I guess he got a different Facebook and he's like, Hey, I need to talk to you. And I didn't get that until like three days after and so I was like, what do you need to talk to me about? And he's like, your dad. And I was like, is he dead? And he's like, no. He's like, I need to talk to you. I was like, okay. So um, he gave me his number and I called him and he tells me about it. And I was like, so before he like describes the video, he just tells me that my dad's yelling at the girls to knock it out, knock a girl, another girl out. Before he described the video, I was like, so let me guess. My mom's standing there or sitting there with like a smile on her face, like nothing else is going on. And he's like, yeah, exactly. And I was like, yeah, because I've been there. I've been in that situation so many times. And so um, I asked him if he would send me the video. And so he did. And that's that's how I got the video. Um, when I was there, um, that was I was kicked out in 2009. And so when I was there, the only phone I had was like a little phone that I could text on. Um, and I had, I had reached out to people about it, but um, it was just to get help to get out of that situation. And um, Basically, I was kicked out because there was that five-year-old girl that was there. She, um, my dad did a devotions and within the IFV religion, some households believe that if you wear pants, you're going to hell. And so her mom wears pants and she was afraid that her mom was going to hell. And I just outright said, it brought me to tears, but I, I, I was like, no, your mom's not going to hell. If your mom's going to hell, then my dad's mom's in hell. My sister's in hell and my dad's sister's in hell. Um, because they all wore pants and they, they all passed away. Um, that got back to my parents and that's when they like decided that because I have been rebelling against this my whole life. Um, before, when I ran away, they went through my room and they found like all the CDs I had, um, stolen from, um, Dollar General and stuff like that, all the posters I had. Um, and so like, they knew that I wasn't like the good Christian woman (laughs) that you're supposed to be. And so, um, that was just the last straw. And so, they had taken my phone and started going through it and found out that I was already planning on leaving. And so they were like, well, you're already uh, planning on leaving. So we're just going to kick you out. We just got to find you a place to go to anyways. And so I don't remember how long it was, but I wasn't allowed to leave the table outside my dad's office. And then my mom would have to walk me home. (laughs) And so I wasn't allowed to leave like my parents side basically. Um, And so um, during this time, my mom's aunt passed away or was got really sick. She got, um, cancer and, um, me and her were kind of close. And so my mom was going to go visit her on her deathbed. And I asked if I could go and they said, no, we're taking Julian, which is my younger brother who never really met her. And that was just another like punishment. (laughs) Um, well on their way home, she ended up passing away. And so my grandma said she was going to come and my parents are like, good. Can you take her? So, um, we go to the funeral and my parents make me sit in my grandma's car. I wasn't even allowed to attend the funeral. And, um, Mm. basically from there, we just went home to my grandma's house, which was always the only place I ever felt safe growing up. So. 
so what, so, okay. So, I mean, you have the, the girls home, you have agape and then circle of hope. And, um, you know, did you, did you notice, was that, the, was that the first time that he was completely in control of one of these homes? I was going to say he was the principal at, um, hope. And then he was like the Dean of staff at agape. So he, had some authority there, but like, this was the first time he was ever in like control of everything. So, um, can you, I mean, we've, t- I've talked to people from Hips of the house from, um, from, uh, in Pace, Florida. I'm trying to remember the name of the school now, new beginnings. Um, I've talked to different people. So can you just walk me through what a day in the life of a quote unquote student at, um, circle of hope looked like, like what, what was the day to day there? Um, It depends on the year because when they first opened up, it was honestly just hard labor. We were cleaning. The guy who owned the house was a major hoarder and there were like, he so much so like that he had bags of money. He had bags of like jewelry that were, was like expensive jewelry. He had magazines that were old magazines. He had nasty trash bags in there, meat in the freezer that was in there for like whoever knows how long. And so like we had to clean and like make it livable in there. Um, so for the first, I would say, I would say a year we were just cleaning. It was very rare that we did schoolwork. Very rare. Um, once a parent started complaining about that and like, they were like contemplating suing or they were going through the process of suing my parents, that's when they started implementing, um, more school. And so like, myself, I would have to wake up at four 30 in the morning and start breakfast. And then, um, the girls would be getting up around the, or the higher up shirts would be getting up around the same time. And then they would be getting ready, um, taking their shower, whatever they need to do. And then they would be getting the girls up to go outside and work. Um, yeah. my parents would wake up around like five thirty six, And then, um, Honestly, I don't know what they would do. My dad would go into his office. He did have TV, so he would watch the news. Um, okay. And then he would sit at, sit at his desk and read his Bible. Um, the girls would still be, like, outside working, and then um, they would break off into, like, school crew and then, like, work crew. So then um, at this time, I would have to go back into the school office and grade all the tests and, like, do, like – the girls like answer like their questions and stuff. And, um, there was, um, a work crew happening. So like, they're like girls would still be outside doing like horses and like random things. Cause like, like I said in the beginning, the prop at all livable. And so like, we were still working it up, like cleaning out different pens that had like, right the barn was also a pile full of junk, the, um, other house. So like we were still doing like a lot of work. Um, and then we would like clean up for lunch, um, and then go back to school. And then the other girls would go back out to work and then we would do dinner around, I would say, I think I had to have it on the table by six. I was never on time because I had so much I had to do. I was never on time. Um, so, the girls, I think we were going to bed by like nine, eight thirty nine at that time. Mm-hmm. But that was basically the routine. Um, what was the schooling? Was it like paces or was yeah. it? Okay. Yeah. Okay. The accelerated Christian education. Right. Okay. So um, just tell me, um, I, this is the question I'm always curious about. So like, obviously, you know, the way that these homes exist in their current state, the, all the ones I'm hearing about, shouldn't be operating. Um, I think that's a pretty clear um, thing, but I'm curious from your perspective, like, I think there's people who would be like, well, what is the option? Like if someone has a situation where they're dealing with a teenager who, you know, needs some kind of help, you know, what is a good option for them? You know, why, what's wrong with these homes? Like, obviously from your story, there's very specific things wrong, but if you could, like, if you could take the money that's being funded into all of these different schools and you could create something to help, you know, troubled teens, you know, using their terminology, like what do you, what would your ideal version of that look like? Or what would, what would be a a good alternative to what they're doing? Honestly, I don't know because we're dealing with humans. (laughs) So like, right. Exactly. 
I, I feel like anything could go wrong, but if the like agape, it, not saying agape in general, but schools like agape, I feel like parents should be able to just walk in whenever they want and like talk to mm. their kids. Obviously, not when they're sleeping and like it's disturbing. Right. Yeah, but I feel like they should have access to their kids. I mean, they're my like your kids. Like they're not these people's kids. I think that's honestly the number one red, red flag is if you can't talk to the own like thing you gave birth to. Um, right. I should say. Um, right. Yeah. Honestly, like I don't agree with the ACE curriculum. So I feel like if you're going to yeah. do these, then maybe like public schools so they can have counselors within that school system too. I don't have an answer. I just, I feel like, parents should be parents and I know that there are hard kids but um mm-hmm. they have mental hospitals I don't say I don't want to say they're the answer either but I just know what I grew up in is definitely not the answer because they took those kids right. off of vacation and gave them the bible and right. that's not that's not helpful right yeah no, um so tell me a little bit like um I mean obviously when you initially left like kind of what your experience was and then um, what pushed you to kind of go the, you know, I guess activism route, if we want to use that, that kind of terminology? Um, when I first left, I just, I didn't want to think about it. So I got into, um, I didn't like drinking, so I got into drugs. Um, and so I just like pushed it mostly away. And then um, when I was like two, uh, my dad would, like I said, I didn't, I don't remember this time. I just remember hearing stories about it my dad would always take me places. And so like, he was always, I was always a daddy's little girl. And so like, he would call me up saying, Oh, these girls are saying this about me. These girls are saying this about me. And he would be crying. And, um, it always was weird because I'm like, why would you be in a room alone with them? Especially because you've put the rule into place that you have to have two girls with you at all times. And, um, so like I would jump online and I would cuss these girls out and I lost all, all of them, like all of them. And I like broke up at one point in time. Um, totally understandable. But, um, in 2012, um, I tried talking to my parents again. My, I gave birth to my son on December 11, 2012. And my mom flew out and she was in the room with me. And, um, I was trying to get the relationship I never had with my family And, um, basically I, I spanked my son and I, it was just, I I don't remember what it was for. I just remember I went to go spank him and he put his hand back and it left a mark on his hand. And my husband came in the room and he's like, what did you just do? And I was like, well, I think it was, he bit me. I can't remember what he did. I just remember, um, doing the whole reaction because that's just how I was raised. And, um, so he like, (laughs) we got into an argument because I was like, this is how I was raised. This is blah, blah, blah. And then I showed him the um, book I was raised on, um, Debbie Pearls to train up a child. And uh, we had a long conversation of how like, um, this isn't right. This isn't right. And I felt really guilty. Like I felt really guilty and um, started going to therapy. And um, basically a lot more came back to me than just, um, the, the over beatings. It was like being picked up by my, my neck and being thrown into the toilet, um, being called a bitch, being called a cunt, being told that um, I was never going to amount to anything or, oh, you should be more like your sister or you should be like this. You should be like that. And then um, girls that were um, just getting out because I had gone back and visited. Um, I had surgery right after I had my son and I couldn't, I couldn't hold my son. I couldn't do anything. And mm-hmm. so I needed help. And I went back And so I got to know some of the girls. And so those girls that were getting out were messaging me, telling me that my dot, my father was um, sexually molesting them. And to be quite honest, when they messaged me, I was like, no, that's not true. That's not true. But then I was like, these girls have never met the other girls. And I know what I went through growing up. I know how I witnessed my dad have girls in his office and appropriately inappropriately massaging his head no other girl just one girl and the door wasn't all the way like it wasn't all the way shut but it wasn't all the way opened it was cracked and that's not okay um and so I called my brother Nate and I was like hey can you give me Maggie's phone number 
And that's one of the girls that was made to stay after she was 24. Um, and so he gave me her phone number and I called her and I was like, you have no reason to lie to me. I was like, can you please tell me if my dad really molested you? And she went through the whole story and her story lined up word for word with the other girl's story. She never met this. They never met. They don't know each other. Uh, Maggie was there when I was there. This girl had gotten out in 2000 and um, I want to say 2016, 2015. And um, so it was just like, yeah, no, that's, that's, that's happening. Like it's happening. I can't, I can't deny it no more. I can't. Um, I just needed to face it because it wasn't healthy. I was, I was, um, I've been suicidal my whole life, but I, I was really suicidal um, around hearing a lot of this stuff. And so I was like, I just need to um, open up about it and realize that I am not my parents. I'm not the ones that are doing this, but I can use my voice to help these kids going through this now because it's not right. And um, I don't know. It's just very therapeutic in a way, um, being able to use my voice and like getting the girls together and like telling them, like I, I went through and I re-added so many people, but I was apologizing because, um, I basically told them to be quiet. I mean, it was way worse than that, but I told them to be quiet and obviously I should have never told them to be quiet. Was it that video that was sent to you that kind of prompted you to like really be proactive and kind of starting to share these stories? Cause you kind of went from like trying to silence things that you didn't want to believe were true to now. I mean, like I said, like you're, I mean, you've had posts go viral with like, you know, I mean, Yelp just shut down reviews to the home because it, you know, because there's been so much in the news, like, yeah. um, you know, so what got you vocal? Was it that video and just like being reminded, like with some hindsight, like, Oh, that's what it was like. Was it talking to these girls? Um, you know, what kind of, gave you that push? Um, well, I do, I do have a couple of private pages and, um, we, we were staying private because it's very traumatic to talk about it openly to a lot of right. people who are going to turn you down and say that that didn't happen. Um, but that video, um, the moment I got it, that was when like, I was like, no one can take my truth away. And so I told the girls, right. I was like, I am going public with this. Like, you don't have to come forward with your stories. Um, but if you're willing to like write me a statement that I can read off, I will read it off because um, my voice alone obviously isn't going to be enough. Um, but um, in 2018, I think it was, I was like all over, no, sorry, 2016, I was all over Yelp writing my review about my parents. And I, I would go through this like long um, list of everything, not everything, but a lot of the stuff we endured as kids. And that like, is like my dad soaking my brother's feet in bleach, my dad um, beating us with golf sticks and stuff like that. Um, but they kept taking my review down. And so I started feeling like un unaccomplished or whatever. And so I went to Dr. Phil and this was in 2016. And I was like, I typed in, um, my father runs a cult. Girls are uh, physically, mentally, and religiously sometimes sexually abused. Um, here. And they like called me back almost instantly. And um, they're like, yeah, like they were going to do the show like two weeks out. And they're like, we just need mm -hmm. to get your parents wow. permission. And so uh -huh. I gave them my parents number, but I told them, I was like, they're not going to give you the permission. And I was like, honestly, they're not going to give you a permission. But I wanted, what I wanted was because I had told all of these girls to um, shut up. I basically wanted to apologize to them for everything because I know even there, I was very unfair to some girls. I can't remember what I've done, but I know I was unfair. It's a power trip. Um, but I wanted to like apologize to them and we wanted like a little kind of reunion, but to be able to talk about what we witnessed. And um, so she called my parents and she's like, no, we can't. And she's mad at you because you're trying to get your brother to move out with you. And I was like, um, that's only part of the story. I was like, my brother's meeting up with random people online and where they live is like one of the um, main trafficking, like highway sex trafficking um, areas. And it just scared me. I was like, so I was like talking to him, telling him once he turned 18, he can move out with me. Like, don't go meet up with random people. It's not like I was like trying to get him to like move out with me now or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so um, they turned the show down. 
And then um, that video came out and that's when I was like, yeah, no. And so I went public um, on Facebook. I just like turned my whole Facebook public at that point in time. I was like, no, just (laughs) screw this. We're going public. And then I actually had um, a lot more supporters than before. I had people messaging me saying, oh my gosh, like I knew something was going on. I just didn't know it was that bad. And then like my friends from Agape were like, I remember your bruises. And I'm like, yeah, like, (laughs) um, (laughs) I just, I remember trying to show people every like chance I could, like, this is what's going on behind closed doors, Mm -hmm. but it never, it never worked. So once that video happened, I was like, yeah, people can't deny me. Like no one can deny me my truth. I mean, they can try, but yeah, they can't. So, right. So, um, I mean, obviously aside from like lots of people watching it, like what's been the response to what you've been doing and like, what are maybe some of the messages you've been getting or people reaching out? Like I'm, I'm sure there's been a lot of positive, if the, that's a weird word to use, but a lot of good feedback about what you're doing. We've only had <clears throat> like two ex students from circle of hope telling us to shut up. And then, um, I've had like a few people asking, cause like, I asked, someone asked me if I forgave my parents and I, I have, I have forgiven them for what they've done to me because I can't, I can't control it. There's nothing I can do about that. Um, what I can control is what's going on and I can use my voice to fix that. And so people don't like the fact that I have like forgiven my parents because they're like, Oh, you're just as bad as them because you're forgiving their actions. But the majority of it is a lot of positivity. Um, it's really weird because like, I, I honestly thought it would just be like survivors from like institutional abuse but i've been Mm -hmm. getting like a lot of girls from like the middle east like messaging me telling me it's nice hearing other women speak out against um religion like that and i honestly like Mm. never thought i would ever um get any message like that so right but a lot i've been getting a lot of like positive messages from people telling us they support us and um wanting to hear more on all these all these schools and i'm like I'm just me. So I've been like trying to right. all the other people that like do stories on this. Right. Um, so what's kind of the, you made a ton of amazing progress so far, but what's the, what's maybe the next step, you know, what can people expect to see happen? Like, I know you're just one person, but you're making, you know, it seems like you're putting a lot of effort and time into this, which I think is awesome. Um, and so what's kind of the big goal? I know you mentioned potentially, you know, finding ways to like help people who are survivors, you know, financially, like I think you mentioned something like that to your stuff. So can you talk about that or maybe where people can, you know, go to find more info about what you're doing? Yeah, I did start a GoFundMe because a lot of the times with circle, like with circle of hope girls, um, I was getting messages saying that they made, they kicked them out. And so the girls were made to walk from circle of hope um, to town. Thankfully there has been people in town that picked them up and like took them in and stuff but a lot of these girls go homeless. And, um, there was one girl, I don't um, know how to explain it other than like, my parents will tell the girls, like your parents don't love you. If they loved you, you wouldn't be here. And then on the phone, they'll tell the parents, Oh, she's talking like this about you. She's talking about like this about Mm -hmm. you. And then they'll make the girls write home saying, Oh, you're too worldly. I don't want to come home. And so they destroy the relationship with the parents. A lot of these kids are adopted too. So, There was one girl that they put on a bus after they kicked her out and they sent her to her hometown, but they didn't tell her that her parents moved to Costa Rica. And so um, she ended up wandering that town until someone finally told her your parents have moved. And so um, like she, thankfully my brother ended up taking her in and like helping her get onto her feet. But there's other girls that aren't as fortunate and they go into drugs and um, like me, (laughs) Thankfully I had friends that got me out of it and um, amazing people, but not every person is fortunate enough. So I do want to get some funding to get these kids some sort of help. I don't know exactly how we're going to do this yet. I do want to be able to get them into apartments or not apartments, sorry, hotel rooms if that ever happens because they should not be sleeping on the street. Like I know what that's like and that's scary. Um, And so if someone reaches out to me, I want to be able to have the funding to be like, Hey, I can put you up into a hotel room for this amount of um, nights, but we need to get you into a job. We need to get you into an apartment like help them find all of this. Um, And then lawyers, like, um, because if they want to sue, they need to be able to have that ability to sue because I know I waited five Mm -hmm. years and (laughs) that was not 
Mm-hmm. Is that, what's, what's the statute of limitations in Missouri? Do you know? Um, in Missouri, uh, for non-sexual offenses, it's five years. Sexual offenses, it's, um, it's, there's no statutes of limitations, but okay. a lot of the girls that have been um, sexually molested, have, they don't have the money to go after a lawyer. And then a lot of the lawyers in the area of Springfield even turned me down when I was like trying to find these girls lawyers. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why, I don't know if it's because they are affiliated with any of these schools. I just know that it's hard finding people to help. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when you're going after a religious institution, like there's a lot of people that just steer clear of that kind of stuff. So Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I definitely, I mean, I love seeing everything that you're doing and you know, it's not, I, I, I feel for you with sharing these kind of stories and it's not easy to be doing that day in and day out. So I applaud you for, for doing that. Um, and I look forward to seeing, you know, all the stuff that you keep putting out. Um, I appreciate you being vocal about this. Like I said, it's, you know, there's that extra layer, like when you're, you know, it's hard enough to speak out against something you're raised in or, you know, something you experience, but then like when it's family involved, like there's so many other layers to that. Um, so I mean, just keep doing what you're doing. And, you know, I, I think there's a lot of people who are touched by what you're doing and, and seeing, I mean, you can read through the comments, like there's, there's tons of people who are, you know, even if they didn't grow up in that world, you know, survivors of abuse, survivors of religious abuse somewhere, uh, it means a lot to them. So, um, they, yeah. I was going to say, it's just, honestly, it was like really like overwhelming with all the support, especially all the other survivors coming forward. Because honestly, I knew that the girls from Circle of Hope were kind of afraid. So I wasn't even yeah. sure. But like just even having that, it was just like, I don't know. It was just really amazing because it felt like we were all united, strangely mm-hmm. enough. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Well, um, thanks so much for, for joining me on here and for, um, you know, just talking through all of this. And I know you've been, you've been kind of doing this tire- tirelessly for, you know, the last couple of weeks and months. And so um, I'm excited to be able to connect with you, hear your story, and hopefully someone that hasn't heard this gets a chance to check you out and see what you're doing. So. Well, thank you for okay. having me. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for listening to the Preacher Boys podcast. If you appreciated the content on the show, please leave a review on iTunes and don't forget to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter with the handle at Preacher Boys Doc. Additional information can always be found on PreacherBoysDoc.com.